Um, so the focus of my remarks is my new book, The Israeli Solution, a one-state plan for peace in the Middle East, but to give you a sense of why I wrote it and why I think it's so for us to be having this conversation today, um, let's just, I think it's important to start with a few current events that just uh, happened this past week in the United States on college campuses regarding Israel. Um, they were the focus of my uh, column in the Jerusalem Post last Friday, um, this past Friday. And so I'm just going to give a couple of examples. At Vassar College in, uh, in New York, uh, they had this incident, which is really quite remarkable, uh, last month in February, there's a group of uh, students who were preparing, uh, attending a seminar in preparation for a trip to Israel um, to discover, or to, to discuss and research water issues and how they're being handled uh, by Israel with the Palestinians in Jordan as well. And you know, Israel is a world leader in desalination projects and technologies, uh, most and, and recycled water products, most Israeli agriculture is produced with uh, recycled sewage water. Um, a lot of our drinking water today comes from desalinated water from uh, the Mediterranean. So this is something that has really revolutionized the water industry. And Israel is a lot to study. But when the uh, Centers for Justice in Palestine, which is an anti-Semitic hate group that's been active now in college campuses throughout the, uh, the country, found out that Vassar College was sending children or students to Israel on this program, they began picketing the class and uh, trying to intimidate the students into dropping it and uh, saying that uh, the Palestinians don't want them to come and study there and that uh, they are uh, acting as racists and denying the human rights of the Palestinians by coming and really just accusing them of of being uh, accessories to murder and genocide by wanting to study uh, uh, water with the professor of earth science. So it's interesting since the professor herself, you know, is about uh, probably much more at home with radical politics than she ever would be in a room with me and, and my family. Um, she's uh, got all the right uh, university credentials. She's a lesbian. She, she, she's uh, pushing uh, for gay rights and homosexual marriage, all of the key items. She's a professor of earth science, so just sort of assume that she really is concerned about global warming and all of the right issues. But she did this. She organized this trip as a professor of earth science, and suddenly she's being accused of being a fascist. And, and uh, so she goes to, and her, and her students are being, or her students are being intimidated and attacked and picketed uh, and assaulted for wanting to study with her and go to Israel. So to, to study about Israel and to plan a trip to Israel, they're being attacked by their fellow students at Basel. So she complained to the administration. And the administration convened some Orwellian community, you know, a committee about the diversity and freedom and thought and non-freedom of thought and diversity. <laughs> and, <clears throat> And so everybody pointed out that all of the activists in this hate group and students for, for justice for Palestine were people of color, and all of the students in her class were white, which meant that we understood who the good people were and who the bad people were, and they, were, they continued to be attacked, not only by uh, the students for justice in Palestine, but also by their fellow students for being racists, for wanting to study about Israel. And this was a Vassar, and it got very ugly and very anti-Semitic uh, in, in this event. And um, again, this was not a ZOA student mission to Israel by any stretch of the means. This was a very radical professor who was taking her students to study something that was not related specifically to anything having to do with Israel and the Palestinians. It had to do with science and, and water, um, but it didn't matter. Uh, her politics didn't matter, the politics of the seminar didn't matter, the politics of the trip didn't matter. What mattered was that they recognized Israel's right to exist and that they were going to go to Israel. And for that, they were demonized and delegitimized on campus and dehumanized on campus and, and denied their freedom, of ethnic, their academic freedom, right? I mean, you go, you try to go to a class that you chose and you're assaulted for having done so, that means that people are, are removing your academic freedom. At University of Michigan last week, you had the student government compelled, coerced by the administration to take a vote that they had 
that they had decided to postpone indefinitely just two weeks earlier about divesting university holdings from companies that do business with Israel, which again is a blatantly bigoted anti-Semitic uh, move that is being pushed in campus after campus by these anti-Semitic groups uh, who claim that the Jews are not a nation, we have no right to self-determination, we have no right to a history, we have no right to uh, our, our homeland. And as a result, it is the responsibility of everybody to deny us all of these rights that accrue to every single other country and every single people on the earth um, and to uh, wage economic warfare against Israel through these boycotts, divestment, and sanctions uh, campaigns. So the student government of the University of Michigan uh, decided that they didn't want to vote on it. And as a consequence, their version of uh, Students for Justice in Palestine, which is another Orwellian name group, Students for Academic Equality or something in Freedom, uh, they staged a sit-in in a teach-in with all of these anti-Semitic uh, rabble-rousers rabble like Ali Abu Mia from Electronic and Defada. Um, and then throughout these sit-ins that they had in the student government, which they effectively occupied, um, they were calling Jewish members of the council, dirty Jew, kite, members of the Jewish community who were part of the student government were receiving death threats from pro-Palestinians. So this is, these are actually felony acts that are taking place on the University of Michigan campus. And how did the administration of the University of Michigan respond to this by telling by forcing the president of the student council to apologize to the Palestinian activists for postponing the vote and requiring them to vote immediately on this uh, thing. So providing uh, defense and protection to the anti-Semitic agitators and denying protection to the student government for standing up to them. So the student government, as Stu said, they really are courageous and wonderful children. People, I keep calling them children because my nephews are still children in their college. But, um, <clears throat> They're not kids, and they behave like in a way that most adults don't behave, unfortunately, on college campuses. And they decided, okay, well, we have to protect ourselves from murder, so let's make this an anonymous, a, a secret ballot, which is unusual in these campus governments. And then they defeated the uh, motion by 27 to 9 with six abstentions. So that was, I think, an act of moral courage that is all too rare. <laughs> college after college, we're seeing Jewish students under assault for daring to support Israel openly. For not only daring to support Israel, that's, you know, it's not that they're, they're Carol and Glicks. These are people who, you know, are, are, are expressing mild support for Israel or support for Israel's existence in smaller borders and larger borders, what have you. I mean, these are not, these are, again, these are not militant Zionists that are being attacked. These are milk toast Zionists at best that are being attacked. And it's important to point that out because that's part of the problem, I think. So what's weird is that, you know, I, as uh, Howard mentioned, I graduated from Columbia in 1991. And Columbia, when I went there, I was a freshman in 87, I graduated in 91, so it was during the first, it was during the Palestinian uprising. And, Pal and, and Columbia was really, it still is, was really the epicenter of anti-Israel agitation because Edward Said was there. And they used to bus in uh, Muslims from Brooklyn and Jersey City to attend these events and, and everything like that and to, to heckle pro-Israel speakers. And we were dealing with stuff like that, but we were never dealing with anything of, uh, in, on the order of what's happening today. It was, it was as bad as could be in 1989 and in 1990, but that in 1989, 1990, 1991 was nothing. It was nothing. It was a walk in the park compared to what students in every single university practically in the United States is dealing with today. And the question is, why? Because it's sort of ironic in a way that this is going on in 2014, 2013, really it started in 2000. After Israel has been engaged in the so-called peace process for 20 years, okay? and since 1993, Israel's primary strategic objective has been to appease the Palestinians, has been to appease the PLO, has been to enable Palestinian self-determination. Um, that has been the centerpiece of Israel's national strategy for two decades, more than two decades, and we're now in 2014. So how do we explain this, right?
right? Because I was there when, when Shamir the Meanie was prime minister, right? And what I had to deal with was nothing like what students have had to deal with, with Ehud Olmert who wanted to give away everything to the Palestinians, the Temple Mount, take it, who cares, this, take it, who cares, you know, Hebron, never heard of it, right? Same thing, Barak, this, this started during Barak, when Barak tried to give up the Temple Mount. That was when we saw this explosion of anti-Semitism on campus in a way that we had never seen before. At least not since the 1930s and 40s. So, <clears throat> So how do I explain this? It seems like an anomaly, right? What, what, what happened? So my argument is that the reason that it's happened in this way for, for two decades, I mean, it has a lot to do with what's been happening in the Islamic world. It has a lot to do with what's happened in U.S. academia with the embrace of political correctness, which is really just sort of a totalitarian concept that's based upon blocking reason from, from, academ uh, from academia and moving forward with, with Again, yeah, with Orwellian thought police that bar reason from, from campuses. But I think that on a specifically Jewish level, the reason that it's happened is because the Jewish community and the state of Israel adopted the two state paradigm. Because when you look at it uh, from the outside and try to figure out what this whole thing is about, this two state solution to the peace in the Middle East, it's about placing all the blame for the absence of peace on the Jews. Because the two-state solution uh, claims that the reason that there isn't peace in the Middle East today, the reason there's jihad, the reason you have misogyny, you know, you would have 99% of females in, in Egypt undergoing the barbaric practice of female genital mutilation is because there's no Palestinian state. I mean, everything redounds to that. Jihad redounds to that. Misogyny redounds to that. Authoritarian, authoritarian politics redounds to that. Civil war redounds to that. Everything redounds. Everything is caused by the absence of a Palestinian state. The reason why I had to take like five minutes before this lecture, because I just gave this lecture in LA, but I forgot my notes there. So when I was leaving the house to come here, I couldn't find it. But I had this great quote in my notes from, that Bill Clinton gave in 2010, where he said, the, if, once the Palestinian state is established, we will see 50% of terrorism, not only in the region, but worldwide disappear. Right? And this was the president of the United States. This is what he said in 2010. And, and he's not alone. I mean, this, is, this was a view of Condoleezza Rice. This was the view of, of George W. Bush. This was the view of Bill Clinton when he was president, of Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State of Barack Obama, John Kerry, Warren Christopher, everybody, Madeleine Albright, all of them. And it's completely delusional. But it's also incredibly convenient. Why? Because if the problem is the absence of a Palestinian state, and if the guilty party for the absence of that Palestinian state are the Jews, because they're unwilling to cough up sufficient land to appease the PLO, then you don't have to think about female mutil uh, genital mutilation. You don't have to think about the doctrine of jihad. You don't have to think about the causes of economic privation and instability and, and, and malnutrition and, and uh, illiteracy and all of the rest of the social and political pathologies and religious pathologies that afflict the Muslim world and then come out and threaten the world as a whole. You can just blame the Jews. You can just concentrate your entire focus on empowering the radical left in Israel, whether it's through direct support for politicians that have left-wing inclinations, whether it's Justice Minister Sipi Livni or Barack. I mean, Clinton sent his three chief elections advisors, Shrum, uh, Carville, and the other one, uh, to Israel in the 99 elections to run Ehud Barak's campaign against Netanyahu. I mean, this is just an amazing intervention in the democratic politics of a country that you're supposed to, that you claim is an ally, right? And, and you, or you can funnel millions and millions of dollars, whether it's from the United, from the United States government or from the European Union or from the American Jewish community to these non-governmental organizations in Israel whose sole reason for existing is undermining the democratic nature of Israel empowering the left, which is a tiny minority among Israeli Jews, against the right um, because the left can't win elections. 
so undermining Israeli democracy and feeling really the Israeli electorate and their right-wing leaders, elected leaders, as the primary focus of U.S. foreign policy. They're the problem. Because again, if the solution is to establish a Palestinian state, we should everything, you know, to global warming, is to establishing a Palestinian state, then obviously the only people that you have to concentrate any thought and effort on are those darn Israelis who keep electing the wrong kind of leaders to be in charge of their country. And, and we really see that. I mean, because, right, in Israel, we're looking at John Kerry like he's a lunatic. I mean, what, what, what uh, Defense Minister uh, Moshe Yalom said when he said that he was behaving like an obsessive messianic, he was reflecting the views of the vast majority of Israelis who don't understand. I mean, Syria is on fire. Over 140,000 people have been massacred. So many of them just helpless. And he's in Israel for the 13th time. Mm -hmm. You know, and this is where he's concentrating his efforts. Now, how can you understand that outside of the delusion of the two-state paradigm? You can't. He is sure that the real problem in the Middle East is not Al-Qaeda, it's not Iran, which the Obama administration, of course, is doing everything to appease and empower and enable to become the nuclear power and prevent Israel from preventing it from becoming the nuclear power. You can't, if you're coming to Israel in the midst of all of this, 13 times since coming into office a year, then clearly you're under the delusion that the main problem in the world is Israel, and specifically the Israeli right. So that's from an American perspective, that it's just this delusion. Now from an Israeli perspective, the minute that we accepted the two-state paradigm as a centerpiece for our national policy making, we lost the ability to defend ourselves, right? I mean, you see Israeli spokesmen, and they're good people, but what are they left with? Well, we're pro-peace, we just want peace, and you know, we need defensible borders. Well, yeah, but if your defensible borders come at the expense of terrorism in Kenya, who cares, right? We don't care. You're trying to be provincial, and we're talking about, you know, a global issue here. Your intransigent, so-called, and insistence on being able to defend yourselves against foreign threats are delaying the end of terrorism worldwide. It's your fault that the Boston Marathon was bombed by jihadists. It's your fault that the jihadists uh, blew up a Kenyan shopping mall. It's your fault. It's all your fault because you're standing in the way of utopia. And so, you know, everything that we're coming up with, defensible borders, uh, Palestinian incitement, Palestinian anti-Semitism, Palestinian support for terrorism, nobody cares. You know, and we run around saying we need to humanize the Jewish victims so that they see what type of people the Fogel family were. So that we see, you know, what, what the terror victim really is and what their life, but they don't care. Then the reason that they don't care is that they've been convinced that it's our fault, that they have to take their shoes off at the airport. And we can't defend against that because we're locked in a strategic paradigm that accepts the blame for everything. And that's why, you know, you're tearing your hair out half the time when you're listening to Israeli consuls general talking to people who don't care about anything that they have to say because they're not telling them anything important. Like, for instance, I'm sorry, but this land belongs to us. I'm sorry, but the Palestinian national movement is not about establishing a Palestinian state. It's about destroying the Jewish state. And so let's be clear what we're actually talking about. You're saying that the existence of Israel is the cause of all the bad things in the world. Where have we heard that blame the Jews thing before? <laughs> you know? Because you're not talking about making peace here at all. You're talking about annihilating the Jewish state, and we're just not going to accept that. And you should be ashamed of yourself. And if you don't realize that this is what you're doing, let me school you on why that is exactly what you're doing. Because it's important for you to understand that you're not being pro-Israel when you support the establishment of a PLO state, and you're paying and training a PLO army, mm -hmm. and in demanding that Israel allow the deployment of battalion after battalion of US-trained PLO forces in the major towns and city in Judea and Samaria. They say themselves that they're going to turn their guns on our children. And so you know what? Stop it. But we can't say that if we say, well, we're pro-peace. Because what are the Palestinians?
Palestinians and this, these anti-Semites on campus, students for justice for Palestine, saying they're saying we want justice. And we're saying we want peace. And they're saying that the conditions for peace are justice for them, and justice for them is the obliteration of us. But again, we can't point any of this out because we're not talking about our rights. We're not talking about truth. We're not talking about justice. <laughs> Only they are. All they're saying is lies, as I point out in my book, denying our history, co-opting it for themselves in a mythology that has no basis in reality. But we're taking it lying down because if we don't, what are we supposed to do? Say that our moderate Palestinian partner in pieces of terrorist, the Holocaust denying jerk who, who, who killed all of the athletes at Munich and since then has been running uh, you know, uh, at full throttle against us in both political warfare and terrorism? Well, we can't say that because if we say that, then we're walking away from a paradigm and everybody who's everybody knows that the only way to solve anything in the Middle East is to go forward with this paradigm. And what is this paradigm, of course, of blaming the Jews? Well, we've been here for 90 years, right? We've been here since the British established the, the mandate for Palestine. They had like a five-year window where they were pro-Israel, pro-Jewish, pro-truth. Pro and they, in, in, on November 2nd, 1917, they put out the Balfour Declaration, which formed the basis of the mandate of the League of Nations that was promulgated in 1922 that gave souls the rights to sovereignty over the land of Israel to the Jewish people. And that mandatory writ has never been superseded or, or, or canceled. We still are the only legitimate sovereign in Judea and Samaria. <coughs> we are still the only ones with true rights to sovereignty under binding international law, as I explained in my book. But we don't assert those rights. Because how can you assert your own rights to sovereignty when you're accepting the narrative of a party whose sole reason for existing is denying you your rights? Whose sole purpose in existing, the PLO, is to destroy you? Well, you can't, because you can't play along with this lie. You can't keep trust with this lie if you're acknowledging that it's a lie. So you pretend it away, and then you find yourself in a situation where Jewish kids on master campus are saying, in opposition to this uh, denial of academic freedom to Jewish kids, saying, look, you know, I, I support uh, Open Hill, I support J Street, but you're just not being very nice here. Right? I think that Israel's done a lot of bad things, but please let us study in peace. This is what the Jewish students are saying on campuses all over the country today. Because why? Because they came of age at a time when the Jewish community in the United States, as part of its allegiance to the two-state paradigm, right, stopped really teaching anybody the history of the Jews in the land of Israel and started sublimating that education to peace education. So they've been denied the basic facts. And then they go to campus and everybody says, defend Israel. What am I defending? I have no idea what you're talking about. I think that Israel is bad. Because that's what my teacher taught me when I was studying before my bat mitzvah. You know, and then we were going to have territorial compromises for peace. And Israel now isn't making those compromises. And that's just not right. And this land belongs to somebody else. Hebron belongs to somebody else. Shiloh belongs to somebody else. Beit El belongs to somebody else. And Jerusalem belongs to somebody else. When you hear Jewish students talking about Judaize in Jerusalem, you've got to figure out that you've got a problem here. Right? But how can you figure out that you have a problem here when you're talking about a two-state solution all the time? You can't. So one of the biggest problems that we can't deal with today, we can't deal with because it's something that we brought upon ourselves, which is allegiance to a paradigm that is based on a lie that denies us the ability to defend ourselves. Mm -hmm. It's extraordinary, really. So, you know, I, I, I saw this when I was in the talks with the Palestinians, I saw it, and, and again, why is it that the situation in Colombia was different when I was there than it is today? Because the Jewish students at Colombia were different. It wasn't just, that I was an outspoken advocate for Israel, which I was, but everybody was. There really wasn't that much unique about me. I was a dime a dozen in many ways. I mean, a lot, a lot of students were making the same point. Who knows them today? Who knows them today? And it's a really, really, really dangerous situation to be in when you don't even know your own side. You can't defend it, even if you know that there's something wrong. You know, I'm a Jewish girl at Passer, and I can't figure out 
What's wrong with them denying me my own academic freedom to study about water issues in Israel ahead of a class trip to study this on the ground? I can't figure out what I'm supposed to say in my own defense. Because I guess I must be wrong. Maybe I don't have academic freedom. Anyway, maybe I don't have any rights as a Jewish student. Maybe that's true. Maybe they're right. Who's telling her anything different? It's, it's, it's a horrible situation. And of course, you know, we were told that everything was going to be perfect. We told, were told that all of the anti-Israel agitation that I suffered from in the 1980s and 1990s, and I'm sure you guys had to deal with when you were in college, was all going to go away once we recognized the PLNs, which you and parents told us that was what Uri Severe told us. And instead, we have last week a Jew coming out of a Jewish delicatessen in Paris being bloodied and beat within an inch of his life and then having a swastika painted on his chest, right? Because he dared to wear a kippah in, in Paris. This was never, this was not happening before 1993. It wasn't. It wasn't happening before 1993. So in my book, I say, gosh, can we just ditch this already? It hasn't worked for 90 years. And the reason why it hasn't worked, it won't work, is because the party that's supposed to be appeased by this doesn't want to be appeased. There's nothing that Israel can give it and still exist that it will accept. Because it's not about, the Palestinian national movement is not about establishing a Palestinian state. That's why they've taken all of the land that Israel has given them over the past 20 years and turned every single square centimeter of land that we've given them into a basis for terrorist attacks against Israel because that's what they are doing. That's what they are about. That's what the PLO is. That's why they don't have trouble cooperating with Hamas and they laugh at us we tell them that we expect them to fight Hamas. Because they share the same basic goal. Afterwards, it's sort of like the Israel, the Jews and the evangelical Christians, you know? We'll deal with what happens when the Messiah comes and we find out who he is, right? In the meantime, let's move forward on the common goal. No problem. And we say, well, of course they hate them because they're secular and they're 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 uh, jihadists. Not true. Again, not true, but we tell ourselves things and we just believe them because they're convenient for us to believe. So another one of their big lies to try to keep us in line when we started realizing what a horrible deal this was in Israel was they came out with this bogus census in 1997 that expanded the number of Palestinians west of the Jordan by 50%. Can you imagine if the U.S. Census Bureau came out with a census 2010 and simply increased the U.S. population by, what, what is it now, by 170 million people? <laughs> Just like that, out of thin air, well, that's what the Palestinian <coughs> Authority did. That's what the PLO did. They said that there were 1.34 million Palestinians on the, on the ground that didn't exist. And then from that bogus base population, then they extrapolated. <coughs> Mass immigration. Every single year we're going to have immigration rates of over 15,000 people every single year coming into the Palestinian Authority. Not true. They've been hemorrhaging immigration, except for one year when all the PLO apparatchiks came in in 1994 with Arafat. They've had net immigration year after year. The numbers have only been increasing. And so we have the most children in the entire world, about 15 children per woman in the Palestinian Authority. You know, whatever. It's not true. They had 4.5 children per woman on the West Bank in 1997, and today they have 2.9. They're collapsing, along with the rest of the Islamic world, by the way. Though the collapse in the in the fertility rates in the Islamic world since 2000 is unprecedented in human history. But we continue to believe this lie. And in the meantime, by the way, what's been happening on the Jewish side of the aisle? Well, we've been going forth and multiplying, just like we were told to in that Bible thing, right? Because Jewish fertility over the past 15 years has increased from two to three children per family. And this is not just among the ultra-Orthodox and the, the national religious. This is the main increase has been among secular families. Largely because of the Russian Aliyah. When they had one child in Russia, they got to Israel, and they said, okay, we're in the land of the Bible. Let's go forth and multiply. And they have been it. And it's, it's, it's something that is out of whack with everything that's been happening in the Western world. So the way people's incredulity, incredulity when they hear this, or incredulousness when they hear this, 
is due to the fact that the numbers are so out of whack with everything that's happening in the United States, it's happening in the American Jewish community, which is not reproducing almost at all, and, and in Europe, and Western Europe. But this is just the way things are in Israel. You get more money, you have more kids. You know, you're optimistic about your future, you have more children. And so that's what's been happening. So actually, demography, far from being one of Israel's chief liabilities, is everybody from <coughs> President Obama to Ehud Olmert would have us all believe is a strategic asset. You know, I go into demography and, and demographics and the whole nature of the demographic threat to Israel, which is actually the establishment of a Palestinian state that was bringing in millions and millions of foreign Arabs from these UN refugee camps that are run by Ahmed Jibril and Al-Qaeda and Hezbollah and Hamas. That's the real demographic threat to Israel. You know, if we were to apply Israeli law to Judea and Samaria tomorrow, and the 1% chance that every single Palestinian living in those areas were then to apply for Israeli citizenship and acquire it, uh, you would still have a two-thirds Jewish majority that would continue to grow over time. So there is no demographic imminent threat of demise for Israel. At most, Israel's demographic threat is somewhere along the line of the demographic threat being faced by Europe, except that we're better at dealing with it than the French and the Germans and, and all the rest of the world. So, you know, that's demography, and I go into it in my, in my book. So the Israeli one-state plan for peace in the Middle East is basically, the word solution is something my publisher has put in. I actually don't believe in solutions at all. I don't have a way to manage things, but be that as it may, I'm stuck with it. And uh, the, the, the point of my plan is, is, it's very simple. It says, you know what, this hasn't worked. You know it's worked, Israel has worked. Throughout the Middle East, the only thing that's working today is Israel. And in truth, in the history of the past 66 years, the only thing that's worked is Israel. And in 1967, after we uh, liberated the Jordanian-occupied areas of Jerusalem, we, allowed, we granted permanent residency status to all of the Arabs living in neighborhoods that we had taken control over. And uh, there were 65,000 of them. And uh, so to be permanent residents, and you have a right to apply for Israeli citizenship if you so desire. Um, and that worked out well. And in the Golan Heights, we did the same thing in 1981. Again, it went great. And you know, the only times that they have been applying in significant numbers for Israeli citizenship in Jerusalem were the times when they feared that Israel was going to surrender Eastern Jerusalem to the PLO. It's then that they say, wait, 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 wait. Actually, uh, no, uh, not only do we want Israeli citizenship, but we want a group uh, to peace God save, you know, and then they start buying in French Hill and peace God save and, and all of these Jewish neighborhoods because they so do not want to live under PLO sovereignty that they move into Jewish communities in order to get away from it. You know, you, you, and, and in Golan, in Golan Huts, the Druze didn't apply for Israeli citizenship until the Syrian civil war started, and they said, you know, we worry about our families in Syria and what they're going to do to us, but we worry more about being part of Syria. So, uh, can we beat Israelis now? And that's exactly what's happening. So, you know, I go into my book, I don't think that there's a high likelihood that after Israel applies to close to Judea and Samaria, you're going to have a uh, march of, of, you know, a million people to uh, the population registration. <laughs> but again, if they, if they, because they would say, well, if they would apply their laws, they're not legal. But on the other hand, if they did, again, in the worst case scenario, we got everybody applying for Israeli citizenship and everybody else are getting it, we would still have a very sizable Jewish majority that would continue to grow over time. And the most important thing from my perspective as an Israeli in all of this, and as a Jew, is that we would be asserting our own rights. Everybody says, what's going to happen in the International Court of Justice? What's going to happen in the U.S.? Well, first of all, these things are happening now when we're engaging in and, and loyal to the two-state paradigm. Israel is being divested from now on college campuses. are not divested from, but under threat and demonized, delegitimized throughout the Western world. Now, when you have the Likud supporting the establishment of a Palestinian state and letting Palestinian murderers out of jail as a conscience mill and building a measure for these horrible people. You know, I, I mean, so if this is what's happening now, what are you talking about? 
How can you worry about what's going to happen when all the worst case scenarios that you're discussing could happen if we did this are happening now when we're doing the opposite? Because the thing is, is that if we want to go to the ICC, I mean, they're already complaining about Israeli alleged war crimes with the ICC. Well, what a breath of fresh air if we actually went to the ICC or the International Court of Justice at the Hague and we said, you know what, this is our land. Look at the law. Can we be serious for a second? A UN General Assembly resolution is not a legal document. It's a political document. Let's be straight here about what international law is. Can we have a moment of clarity in this basic issue? Oh, and by the way, the reason that we're the international sovereigns is because we're the only one with a national history here. You want to talk about indigenous rights? Come to us. Don't go to these people. They don't know anything about it. Cy Barricat running around saying, my family were Canaanites. Well, that's interesting for a number of reasons. A, because we know that your family came here from Saudi Arabia in the middle of the 19th century. B, because according to your Quran, right, the Jews defeated the Canaanites and dispersed them throughout the world because they rejected the one God. They were pagans. They deserved, according to your own religion, to be dispersed. And now you're saying you're part of this group? Golly, figure out who you are already, wouldn't you? Really, can we be serious for a second? You know, we would be able to actually defend ourselves because right now, again, in this intellectual and, and ideological straitjacket of an anti-Jewish paradigm, we're stuck. You know, again, if this isn't our land or if this is occupied, if we accept the legitimacy of this, if, of this mendacious narrative, then why does anybody care that we need defensible borders and that we need areas of these these territories for defensible borders, because if they belong to somebody else, then nobody, then it's then that's our problem. We have to deal with it, right? I mean, it would be so like if you didn't have a kitchen, and you walked into somebody else's house and said, "Look, you know, I, I got, I got to cook. I'm just gonna, you, you have to have your whole house except for the kitchen, okay? How does that sound? You know, because I have to make sandwiches, right? They wouldn't care. They call the police on you." Right? You're a home intruder. The fact that you don't have a kitchen isn't their problem. It's the same thing with defensible borders. If this land doesn't belong to us, who cares? But this land belongs to us. So obviously we get to use it to defend ourselves. And if we want to give up parts of it in order to make room for another country, so be it. But let's do it while asserting our rights. Let's not pretend away those rights that have been ours for thousands of years to give them to people who use our less in order to demonize and dehumanize and delegitimate us. You know? Right? I mean, isn't that common sense? So, you know, people, people say, well, we, it, it, Europe is going to do this and, and, and the Arabs are going to do that. Not so. Not so. You think that Egypt is interested in attacking Israel now? And who in Syria would make war against Israel tomorrow? Well, they're busy killing one another. They're busy. <laughs> you know? And by the way, this Bala made war on us in 2006, six years after we left South Lebanon, a year after we left Gaza, when we were, had just elected a government pledged to do the same thing in Judea and Samaria. We had given them no causes belly whatsoever. They did it because I really wanted them to. That's why they did it. They don't attack Israel ever because of anything that Israel does. They attack Israel because at whatever point we're attacked, whether it's from Hezbollah, whether it was Nasser, whether it was Sadat, whether it was anybody who would invade us at the time, they did it because they thought that it served whatever their regime's interest was to do so. Again, regardless of anything that Israel was doing. Nasser didn't start the war of attrition because Israel applied Israeli law to, to eastern and northern and southern Jerusalem after the Six-Day War. <coughs> he did it because he thought that he could get away with it and reverse the, uh, reverse the results of that war. Because he had the Soviets bringing in SAM, uh, anti-aircraft anti guns, and he thought that he could get away with it. That's why he did it. Not for any other reason. And, and we keep thinking that it's all because of us. It's like we're blaming ourselves too, right? We're taking on the blame for other people's calculations that have never had anything to do with anything that we've done because the rejection of Israel never has had anything to do with Israel itself. It has to do with the one thing we've all been ignoring all of these years, which is 
what's happening in their societies, the pathologies of their societies, the sickness inside of the Islamic world. We'd rather blame ourselves because it gives us the potential of solving problems that have nothing to do with us. It's actually moral vanity more than moral, 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 moral fortitude. So, this is a sympathetic moment. So, to go back to the beginning, I mean, what I say in my book is let's be done with this. Let's just be done with this. Let's look at the situation as it is and let's operate on the basis of reality. We're never going to get to a two state solution because the Palestinians don't want statehood. We're not going to commit suicide because we're just not going to do that. Right? We didn't come here after 2,000 years to destroy ourselves. So we're certainly not going to get another opportunity to fix it if we do. This isn't helping anybody. This is not helping the Jewish people in the diaspora. It is not helping the U.S. government try to figure out how to deal with the Middle East. It's only confusing the issue even more for lazy policymakers who'd rather blame Israel than deal with Saudi Arabia. You know? So that's my book. This is my argument. And then just to go back to the students on the college campuses, you know, I get this email the other day. It was in my article. I wrote about this, uh, the coordinator for divestment from the Michigan chapter of We Hate Jews International. And he put this picture on, the, uh, on his Facebook page of himself with his head covered except for his eyes, you know, in standard classic Palestinian terrorist mode with a big knife in his hand, stabbing a pineapple, right? So, and then say, and, and then this caption of his, of his Facebook page picture was game on, right? So obviously, this is like, you know, cotton candy for columnists, so I obviously put it into my column. And um, so then I get, these, I get this email from a, a, a Jewish activist at Princeton, actually, first, and then I got another one from somebody else saying, listen, you know, you were misled by the Washington Free Beacon reporter who first reported the story about this guy's thing because he didn't actually post it in the context of the divestment from Israel campaign. It was this intramural um, Muslim basketball league at the University of Michigan, and that his team was playing against the pineapples. <laughs> and I said, and this is how he shows his team spirit, right? <laughs> you know, because obviously, I mean, when I was growing up in Chicago, all, all of the Chicago White Sox fans were taking knives into the bullets, right? You know, because that's, and with our, with, with ski masks on, because that's just what everybody does. It's just like a sports fan thing to do, right? <laughs> obviously, duh. I mean, but, but seriously, I mean, you know, we just, we're making excuses, making excuses for people who are violent, who are vicious, who are bigoted, who say we have no freedom, we don't have the right to think for ourselves, who are giving us death threats and calling us dirty to and kite. And we're making excuses for them. We're seeing extenuating circumstances. And by the way, the interesting thing about that picture too is that the administration of University of Michigan, that coerce the student government in, into, into uh, 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 voting on the Israel divestment thing with a literal gun pointing at its head, right? They called up the Washington Free Beacon to complain about the article saying that it had been taken out of context. They went out of their way to defend a student who had a violent picture of himself taken and then posted on Facebook. And they wouldn't protect any of the students who were getting death threats. It was an internal issue with the student government, is what they said. Dirty Jew is, an, is, 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 is that that's an issue just of the student government that's got nothing to do with the University of Michigan administrators? Amazing, isn't it? But we're making excuses. Why are we making excuses? Because we've been told that we have no other choice. Everybody who's everybody knows that the only way to go forward is a two-state solution, and we all know what that looks like. Israel gives up Jerusalem, and gives up Judea, and gives up Samaria, to the PLO, and everything will be fine. 50% of terrorism all over the world is just going to disappear overnight once that state is formed. <laughs> President says, uh, yeah. whose wife, right, is, wants to be the next president. So, you know, we have got to stop this madness. We have got to stop making our
arguments in favor of people who want to annihilate us. And the only way that we can do it is if we take ourselves out of the straitjacket and recognize that no, Carolyn Glick's plan to apply Israeli law to Judea and Samaria is not a utopian plan. It is not a perfect plan. It is not without dangers. But it is far more, it is far safer than where we are today. Because again, the most dangerous thing about where we are today is that we can't defend ourselves. And we have to be able to defend ourselves. We have to be able to tell the truth and demand justice for us. Because we're worthy of it. So those are my thoughts, and I'd be happy to take any questions. From you. Jewish. 
uh, and an anti-Semite. It happens quite often, and in fact, more and more frequently these days. Um, and uh, it's it, you know you have to understand that the movement in the United States is going in the direction of the movement in Europe, which is uh, to reject reason, to reject truth, in favor of conceptual frameworks that. Uh, that, that deny the legitimacy of everything that has made the United States the United States of America. And part of that is, is, uh, is accepting you know, the greatness of this country. And I mean, I, this is a completely different lecture, but I mean, look at what's happening on university campuses today. What, what, what are people learning about when they learn U.S. history? Are they learning that this is the greatest, greatest self-defined democracy uh, since Moses got the Ten Commandments? Do they understand what this country is and how profound and brilliant and heroic the nature of the United States of America is? They haven't a clue. Not a clue. It's not just the Jews that were denied the basic knowledge of who they were by, by uh, Jewish educators in the 1990s. <coughs> Americans, regular Americans, don't understand the history of their country. And if you don't have that, then the ability to sway you to all kinds of concepts that are self-destructive in the extreme is enormous. And it's being <coughs> exploited by people who are tenured professors in these campuses today. You know, and I'll just give you an example on the George Fund, Northeastern University. You know, they, they had uh, issues of, of massive indoctrination and anti-Semitism on campus. And the Jewish students, when they tried to uh, get redress from the administration, were just ignored. The, and it's still being ignored. The only thing that they're dealing with on Northeastern campus is the activism of Students for Justice for Palestine. And that's because the ZOA sent them a detailed legal brief, basically, making point by point case why they were in violation of US civil rights legislation. But they haven't done anything to address the anti Semitic indoctrination and intimidation in the classrooms. It just goes on and on and on. Why can't Israel articulate their message better? Well, I just explained that. Yeah. You know, once because we are with the whole two state nonsense and if we're part of that and the PLO is the solution and Israel is the problem. You can't defend yourself if you're in the problem, you just have to go away. In a one state solution, what do we do with the Palestinians? Do they get to vote? What about democracy? Yes, they get to. They, they receive a permanent residency status. Um, automatically, just as the Arabs of uh, Jerusalem and uh, the Golan Heights, the Jerusalem Golan Heights have in the past. Um, and they will have the right to apply for Israeli citizenship. How many people will, will apply? How many people will uh, abide by the criteria of Israel's citizenship law? I don't know. That's a discussion we're going to have to have. But, you know, on this level, I do, I do just want to talk about one thing that I haven't discussed already, which is the issue of security. And people say, wait, they're going to be able to move around freely? How does that work? So I think that it's important to point out that the main cultivator and progenitor of terrorism and enabler of terrorism is the Palestinian Authority, right? I mean, um, and we see this very clearly. If we just look at the data on the positions of Israeli Arabs on the eve of the Palestinian terror war that started in September 2000, and the positions of the, of the Palestinians in Judea and Samaria at the exact same time. Because these populations had, had, had identical positions on Israel's destruction, had identical positions on support for terrorism, the same level of support, the same level of rejection of Israel among both populations. But for every Israeli Arab who participated in terrorist attacks against Israel, you had a minimum of 10 Palestinians who were participating in terrorism. So 10% participation level with identical <coughs> support levels for, par for, par for, for terrorism and Israel's destruction. And you account for this because Palestinians, you know, in the Galilee, the, the, the Arabs in the Galilee, the Israeli Arabs in the Galilee were living under Israeli sovereignty. And so we were had the capacity to break up terrorist cells before they even knew that they were planning on existing in two weeks. You know, we were able to stop it right there at its root before it could take to do anything. 
in almost every case. The Palestinians until 2002 and, and, and really uh, until 2004, they were able to send out terrorist uh, suicide bombers from Jenin and continue to operate after you know, uh, they, they blew up Israelis at a bus stop in a full bar or on a, on a, on a bus in uh, the Galilee or on a Hebrew University cafeteria or whatever it happened to be um, the next day because they were in charge. So the people who were enabling the, the terrorism were also the people who were in charge of the territory. And so Israel's capacity to prevent terrorism was far diminished. Now, if you're looking at a, at a situation where Israel, again, is so sovereign in these areas, I mean, even today, Israel reasserted its security control over these areas more or less by the end of 2004, and that's why we saw such a precipitous drop in terrorism, not so much because of the security threats, but because Israel exerts sole, uh, or, or, or not sole control, but predominant control and is able to operate more or less at will in the Palestinian population center still today. And that's why we're not getting levels of terrorism. And it's not because of intentions, it's because of the capabilities. So if the Palestinian security forces that are the progenitors of terrorism, that are enabling this, that do cultivate it, um, are disbanded, then the fears that are raised by the concept of Palestinians being able to come to Tel Aviv, come to work, come to be integrated into the Israeli economy, again, as they were until 1988, basically, uh, become far diminished because we're capable, again, of preventing terrorism where it starts, as opposed to trying to block it once the bomber is already out. Because once he's out, there's really nothing you can do, it's just going to go off. Um, and go off forever. Um, oh, I keep forgetting that there. Um, so I read this. When is this we're going to go and run? Oh, um, I just got the cable. Um, <laughs> Uh, but you know we'll have to see 
I worry what Obama is trying to do when he goes to Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Hopefully, he won't end that. Um, and I'll just do just do a couple more so I get that one already. I just want to blank. Um, demographically, is there a future for progressive Jews in America? Um, and is there a political future for progressives in Israel? Um, so, look, you know, the, I don't believe that demographics are determinative in the sense that, you know, you have people claiming that uh, overpopulation by whatever, and then they, they don't take into account agricultural innovation. So they were predicting mass starvation by 1975 because they didn't think that anybody would ever think of irrigation. You know, I, I mean, it, it's so that really, the problem with using demographic arguments as determinative of the future takes out so many variables that aren't related to, to demographics that I, I think that, that, that it makes it, many of the arguments implausible. But that doesn't mean that you should ignore demographic data. I think that they're also important. So, you know, when you look at the latest Pew survey of American Jewry, you see that um, the lowest fertility rate in the United States is among Reformed Jews. They're having 1.3 children per, per family, per woman. And the replacement rate is 2.1. So, you know, that's already indicative of a problem when you compound it with, I think it's 75% intermarriage rate among, among Reformed Jews. Um, you're looking at a very gloomy picture for, for that demographic group. Um, and, and for Jews in, in the United States in general. Um, so I think that you know, the numbers don't lie. They don't tell the entire story, but they don't lie. Um, is there a political future for progressives in Israel? Uh, right now, uh, they can't mount, they cannot win an election. Um, but who knows you know, what tomorrow will bring. Today and tomorrow, um, you know, again, what happens uh, I don't see it happening. You know, when you have 70% of Israelis not trusting John Kerry, when you have 85% of Israelis saying there's no chance that we're going to make a deal with the Palestinians, they don't want one. You know, when you're getting these kinds of numbers, and you've gotten them consistent in the past you know, decade, um, it's hard to see in, in the immediate term any, any constellation in which uh, uh, left-wing Israeli political parties are going to cast an amount of majority in Knesset, but you know, uh, the thirst for power makes very strange bedfellows oftentimes. Live and learn. Ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.